Hi, once again, this is Michael Hinkson, your host for Unstoppable Mindset. Today, we get to chat with Marnie Vinkelis. And I'm glad I asked her in advance because there's an I at the end and my screen reader says Vinkelisi, but it's not, it's Vinkelis. Good, good name all the way around. <laughs> Marnie has an interesting story to tell in a lot of ways. Uh, she's written a number of books. She happens to be a person with dyslexia. dyslexia. She has formed her own company. And we're going to get into all of that. And the best way is for Marnie to tell her own story. So Marnie, welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. Thank you. I'm glad to be here and glad to share my story with your audience. Well, and I hope my audience and I'm sure my audience is glad to hear your story that you're going to share. Why don't we start by you talking a little bit about kind of you as a young Marnie, where you came from and growing up and some of those things. It's always fun to start at the beginning. Okay, well, let's start at the beginning. Um, grew up in Chicago. Um, my mother and father divorced before I was even born. So um, the and things happened in the family that put them very far apart. And so I never met my dad, um, never had him in my life, uh, lived about 40 years that way. Um, grew up in the 1950s in Chicago, raised by my mother and my grandmother, who were, you know, two single women alone in the 50s, which was not common. Um, they lived in fear. Uh, they felt that, you know, things weren't going their way. Uh, they struggled with money and they felt control was a really good way to raise children. And mm. that didn't work so well for me, <laughs> but um, I, you know, I did it. I got through it. Um, and so I've written, I've written five books. I've talked about that. I, I will talk about that. I am dyslexic in the fifties. They didn't know what dyslexia was. Mm -hmm. Didn't talk about it. Didn't understand it. I remember dancing with my little black ballet shoes on and there was a red star on one side and a blue star on the other so that I would remember which foot I was supposed to use. So my dyslexia was right there when I was like three years old uh, going around and dancing, but no one ever connected that with reading and at school. So I did pretty well in grammar school, but when I went to high school, we switched uh, from Chicago to Skokie, Illinois. And our high school had uh, a very high Jewish uh, population. And those kids studied hard. And it was, you know, going from city school to suburban school. It was so hard for me. I just couldn't get what they were saying and, and how to write down the concepts. So after about two years in high school, I realized I can't even get through high school. How am I going to get through college? So I dropped the idea of going to college and getting any other education. And um, went into hairdressing, and I I enjoyed it. I really had fun with it. Um, moved from Chicago to Denver, and in Denver, I changed my vocation and I started a toy company, and it was called the Pee Wee TP Company. And I made little play tents for children, and I, then I made costumes, and I'd travel around the country, and I'd sell things at fairs. This is before the internet. This is before cell phones. Um, so all the research I had to find on my products, I had to do in the library in something called the Thomas Directory. And the Thomas Directory had information about you know companies and where where to buy you know different types of things because I was putting all these things together. So this was a pretty successful cottage industry. Um. Decided one day, well, things were happening. Okay, so my books that I write are on metaphysics or personal empowerment and, and intuition. And, you know, intuition comes in many different ways. And I was running a toy company that was running pretty well, but I kept getting a message that I needed to be doing something different. But I didn't know what that was. And I certainly didn't want to leave something that was uh, bringing me income. So I, um, my van was actually my intuition. You know, intuition comes through different ways. Some people hear it, some people see pictures, um, but this was my van telling me, do something different. It never broke down the 15 years I was in business until that last year. 
and it would break down on the road and but I'd be right in front of a gas station so it always protected me but the last time it broke down I was um going to, I was in Kansas heading to Chicago to do some uh, a, a big Christmas show and then over to Texas and um I pulled into a, a gas station because the wheels were making this grinding noise it was sort of strange and I pulled in and um the guy put my my van up on a hoist, unhooked my uh, trailer, put it up on the hoist, and the wheel fell off, mm. just fell right off. And he said, lady, there was an angel on this wheel. I said, I know I put her there. So the bearing was fried. I said, check the other bearing. He says, oh, they don't both go out at the same time. I said, well, appease me. He did. And sure enough, he said, you wouldn't have made it 30 miles on that bearing. So at that point, you know, he he didn't have the parts. He had to order them in. It was going to take three days. I realized I am not going to get to Chicago. I'm not going to be able to do that big Christmas show. And maybe perhaps I need to listen to what's going on here. So this full story is in um, my first book that I wrote called Finding Your Inner Gift. But um, I won't bore you with all those details. I'll just let you know that I stepped into what was uh, a small um, hotel, motel, and I sat down on the bed and I said, that's it. I quit. I talked to the universe. I said, I'm not going to do this anymore. I quit this business right now, this moment. So the van got fixed. I drove back home. I canceled all my shows from September to December. Um, I sell toys. This was a big deal. And I just went into that place of trust just trusting the universe that something's going to come my way. And what, what came my way after about nine months, which I thought was an interesting gestation period, was uh, Reiki. Someone mentioned that I should learn Reiki. Reiki is a hands-on healing modality. And so you might wonder, why am I jumping from hairdressing to toy making to, you know, um, Reiki? Because because I was dyslexic, I didn't think I was smart enough to, you know, work for a company. I didn't think I was of value. It took me decades to realize that I really am smarter than I think. And just because I I don't spell right and I don't comprehend when I read, I'm I'm valuable and I can bring that value to other people. So that's how I started my my metaphysical business. Well, along this way. Somewhere along the line, um, I just I found that I could find my dad. I had never seen him, never met him. And in my last book, it's called They Did the Best They Could, Discovering Your Path to Compassion. In that book, I talk about how I found my dad, how I learned all the stories about my family from the late 1800s in Italy, you know, through now, just so many synchronicities and and stories and realizing how I was lied to all of my life and you know all those unrealistic expectations that I had yet I was able to find compassion for the people that unknowingly hurt me so that's basically me in a nutshell <laughs> what a story well, yeah. that's okay though yeah. um well several things so where in Chicago, did you grow up? Um, on the north side. Okay. And um, after I got married, I lived closer to the lake. But yeah, north north side Chicago. <clears throat> and you lived in Chicago, but you were the south side, correct? Yeah, I was born on the south side and lived there only for five years. And then we relocated to California although I've enjoyed it every time I get a chance to go back. As, as we were talking earlier, um, we both miss Frango Mints from Marshall Fields. Well, I miss Marshall Fields for that matter, but oh, yeah. Marshall Fields and Frango Mints. But along the way, um, several years ago, while traveling through O'Hare Airport, I discovered Garrett's Popcorn. So that's always a treat when I go to Chicago now. Um, and I actually stayed downtown for a meeting and got to go to one of the Garrett's facilities downtown and found it was just the same as it was at the airport. Very good. Oh, yeah. Well, my treat when I go to Chicago is going to the art museum. Mm. I, I just love it. I run up the stairs and go see the Renoirs and 
Um, I, I have my my special places. Uh, Monet, uh, Georgia O'Keeffe are, are some of my favorites. But you mentioned Marshall Fields, and that's actually where I was a hairdresser. So there I was, you go. I was a hairdresser at Marshall Fields. I like the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, although it's been a long time since I've been there, and I'd like to go back. But usually when I go to speak, I'm never there long enough to be able to go see the museum. So I've got to work that out somehow. Oh, yeah. It's, there's there's so much information in Chicago. It's it's just a wonderful place to be. And I love the lake. I love the lake. Well, so you grew up being um, a person with dyslexia, dyslexia, being dyslexic. When did you realize what was really going on? Oh, that's a good question. I... But it must have been somewhere in my, probably when I started writing, you know, um, once I started teaching and writing, which was in my 30s, um, I realized that I had to really organize my thoughts in order to get that information out, out to other people. And so I would, um, I would bullet point things. Um, I would, you know, write write the paragraph, but then underneath that bullet point or number it so that it was very explainable. And the things that people tell me about my books, my first three books are on personal empowerment. And um, people have told me, gee, if I wrote a book about, you know, Reiki and hands-on healing and intuition, I would write a book like this. Mm -hmm. and I, And they often say, it's so easy to understand. And so I had to make it easy to understand for myself, which helped other people. Well, you, and, uh, and, and I gather that you've been pretty successful at doing that. Yes. And, you know, I've got, you know, of course, people that would go over, you know, my copy and, you know, we, we talk about what's not clear or how I put in angles instead of angels, you know, <laughs> different word, you know, letters that I would switch. But one thing that's helped me a lot is Grammarly. And mm. I don't know if your listeners are aware if they write that much, but Grammarly, um, I think, I think you can get, you can get a free version and um, it'll go through everything that you write, whether it's on the computer, on your, on your phone, on your tablet, it will, you can download it so that it's checking your spelling and your words all the time. And that really, really saves me a lot. So I'm really happy um, with Grammarly. That's helped I, me. I think I've tried Grammarly, but it's been a while and I found it to be a little bit inaccessible and maybe it's improved. But for me using a screen reader, there were some challenges with it. But again, yeah. I think that's in the past and maybe they've improved it because they certainly could. Yeah. You know, and another thing I found that helped my dyslexia is when I was writing my memoir, when I was writing, they did the best they could. I I took a, a, a class and um, an online class. It's uh, great courses is, is it's mm -hmm. called. And it was on um, how to write um, nonfiction. And I went through that whole course and I, of course, took notes and I followed what they said. And it really helped me put everything together in a way that it would be interesting for people. Because, you know, one, one thing they talked about was, you know, if you write and you just list things, it doesn't give the reader, you know, the picture. And I'm sure you would understand this, how when you're reading, you want to see the picture, you want to see you know, what did it smell like? What did it feel like? What was the temperature outside? What were they wearing? You know, what were they looking at, you know, through their eyes? And I was able to really capture that and they did the best they could. And many people have told me that as they read that book, they find that my stories are similar to theirs. You know, we all go through struggles as children. Um, and, and so it shows, I went through the same things. The characters may be different. The location could be different, but the the hurt in our heart could be the same. You know, feeling unloved or not honored. Um, it it all it's all similar. And so, in my book, the second half of the book shows how you can deal with those issues and not hold a grudge. Find compassion for those that and and, and people don't hurt us willingly. It usually is unknowingly. Um, and so, well, and, and ultimately, no matter how much, even if it's intentional, they may hurt us. 
in so many different ways. The reality is we really hurt if we allow ourselves to be hurt. I mean, that is if we're dealing with a mental situation, we have control over how we deal with that kind of pain. Oh, absolutely. And we have the ability, if we choose to exercise it, to not let that kind of hurt injure us or affect us to the point where we turn negative and and as a result become very bitter, which doesn't mean that we don't recognize that there was a hurt, but we do have control over how we deal with it. And I've used the example of the World Trade Center many times being in it when it was attacked by terrorists. We didn't have control over the World Trade Center being attacked, but we do have control over how we deal with it. And I think that's true in in all cases. It's really up to us as to how we want to deal with situations we face. Exactly. Exactly. And I, you know, I I do counseling. And as a Reiki master, I'm able to move energy as well as counsel people. And in that counseling, I do talk about you know, how we can look at that person that unknowingly hurt us and, and what happened to them? What put them in this situation? And, you know, people have, you know, these kind of things at work where they've got coworkers or a boss that just really gives them a hard time. And so this is about how can we look at what's the struggles that they're going through so we can better understand their situation and perhaps why they treat us the way they do. And once you understand that better, you can let go of that hurt and that pain. And like you say, have have a, have a different way of looking at it rather than saying, oh, they, they did that to me and, you know, it's not fair. And it's like, you know, we, we move beyond that. Yeah. And the other part about it is, was it intentional or not? If it's intentional, in a sense, that will only determine differently, perhaps, how you deal with it. Right. And if it was intentional, I would say they, they even hurt even more than you do. Mm-hmm. Because someone that yeah. acts out and is, is mean to another person, there's something that's really hurting them inside. And right. if you can find what's hurting them, you can find compassion. You don't have to forgive them for what they did, but you can find compassion for why they acted that way. Well, but even forgiveness is is a very important thing to do, because even if they hurt you and it was very deliberate, you can forgive them, which doesn't mean that you're going to put yourself in a position to allow them to hurt you some more. As my wife used to always say, don't put your sails in their wind, but it doesn't mean that you can't forgive them and recognize and move beyond it. Right. Right. I I totally agree. And that's the kind of things that I talk about in my book is, is how, how to get through and, and just, you know, sort of float through, through life. You know, they did the best they could, I was going to call that walking in grace, but I realized the title really didn't tell you a whole lot about what's inside the book, but, right. you know, walking in grace, that kind of thing of yes, things happen and I can be graceful about how I, I deal with it and be kind to people. And that's what I look at. Tell and, us. Yeah. Tell us about you, you finding your father, you said that you, after 40 years, finally did that. Can you talk about that a little? Um, I I can. Um, let's see. Because I was doing art shows, um, I happened to be traveling to Chicago for an art show. And two weeks before I was leaving, my, my mother um, called me up and she moved from Chicago out here to Denver after she had retired. And she told me that a friend of hers in Chicago, someone that was actually in their wedding party, said, they're saying some prayers for a Tony Van Calise at our parish. Do you think it's the same person? And my mom, you know, didn't know for sure, but maybe thought that it was. And so she called me up and she said, well, they're saying prayers for your father at the parish, not that he was ever a father to you. And those Mm -hmm. words just like hit me in the heart. And when I shared with her months later that she said that, she said, oh, that's a terrible thing to say. I would never say that. So it's interesting how we respond to a shock. Here, my mom didn't have any contact with him. Um, As I say, they got divorced. The families weren't weren't kind to each other. And there was a confrontation. And my dad left the city and stopped paying child support after about a year. Um, So that was really a hardship on my mom in the 50s 
trying to, you know, raise two children. And what also happened to her is she got divorced and she moved in with her mother and father. And the month after the divorce was final, her father died. Mm. So now she's got my brother, who is about a year older than me, myself, brand new baby, and has to take care of two children and her mother. Because my grandmother didn't work since she was since she got married. I mean, that's how things were back in the in yeah. in the twenties and thirties. And um, Grandma did have one job when she was nineteen. She worked for the Western Union, and her job was to deliver the messages that came in. So they would come in on a telegraph, and they'd have to be quickly brought over to another room where they would be typed in and sent out. And they wore roller skates. So at 19, grandma took the messages and roller skated from one part of the building to another. So I um, figured, well, in, in the late 40s, you know, her skill of roller skating was not going to really give her a very good job. <laughs> so hence why she didn't go out and get a job. So my mom, you know, here she is, you know, having to support, you know, two children, herself and her mother it was really tough. And that's how she lived the rest of her life. But anyway, so, so I so can see. Derby, so roller derby wasn't in her future, you're saying? No, she wasn't going to be a roller derby queen. <laughs> <laughs> so I can sort of understand why my mother was angry at, at my dad. And, and you know, but that, that really hurt me. So her saying that, you know, not that he was ever a father to you, I didn't feel open to say, and mom, give me the name of that friend of yours so I can go find him. You know, that door was not open. Yeah. And. And so um, in my book, I talk about how I go into my mom's uh, condo. I have my children take her out to lunch and, and I go inside and I'm, I'm rifling through her um, index cards to try to find this woman, Macy, and, and find her number, you know, and, and um, I, I did find it. Um, I did call her up. Uh, so when we get, we went to Chicago and brought the kids with us, but this confrontation of meeting my father, I didn't know what would happen. So in the book, there's a beautiful story of how I go to Macy's house and we look in the telephone book for his name. And, and it was there, which shocked me because my mother had an unlisted number. My father had an unlisted number. Neither one of them wanted to find each other. You know, he would have been thrown in jail for not paying child support. Yeah. And, you know, so all that. So I thought, well, this this can't be this can't be him. Um, but I look at the address and the address is around the corner from Macy's house. This woman's house who was in their wedding party. He lived around the corner from them, mm. which uh, I, I talk about synchronicities in this book. This one was way too bizarre. My mom would visit Macy. They would go out for walks on hot summer nights in Chicago easily have walked by his house, never saw him, right? So I'm thinking, probably not him, but let's, you know, Macy said, well, here's his phone number. Why don't you call him up? I said, what would I say? I said, no, I'm not calling him up. I'm walking over there. So my husband, Macy, and I walk over to his house and I knock on his door. And the uh, it was a hot summer day. It was uh, the 3rd of July. The wood door was open. The screen door was closed. An old, frail man walks to the door, um, white hair, didn't look really healthy. And uh, I asked him, I said, are you Tony Vincalise? He says, yes, I am. I said, well, I said, were you married to Lorraine? He said, yes. I said, I'm your daughter, Marlene. And at that time, you know, originally my name was Marlene. And um, he looks at me and he said, I had a son named Jimmy. And with that, it just it just shocked me. I was like, story of my life, you know. Everybody, I, I thought my brother was more honored than I was in the family. <laughs> so I said, here I am, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. Once again, he doesn't remember me, but he remembers my brother. And I just sort of took a little step back, and my husband placed his hands on my shoulders, just on my back, and he just gave me a little nudge, and I could hear him, his thoughts in my head, saying, "Go ahead." You can do this. It's okay. And so I again spoke and I said, well, I'm his sister. I'm Marlene. And he said, I had a baby girl. I only held her once in my arms. I said, open the door. You can hold her again. 
dead silence. He's staring out into space. Nothing's happening. No one knows what's going on. And Macy finally says, Tony, Tony, open the door. This is your daughter. Open the door, you know? And with that, it takes him out of that shock. And he opens the door and he falls into my arms and he just sobs. And he says, Marlene, Marlene, I never thought I'd see you again. This is a miracle. This is a miracle. God sent you to me. And that's how the story began or continued. So just a little blip of 40 years, right? <laughs> just a little blip. But, uh, just, a, just a little blip. So, but you were able to, to reconnect. Well, how did your mother react to all of that? Boy, that, that, that was another story. Yeah, I uh, bet. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this. He, he had lung cancer. And uh, if you know anyone that has lung cancer, he, he was not, you know, the doctor told him in the beginning of the year he wasn't going to be around long. Mm-hmm. And this was July. Um, but um, he says to me, you know, we, he, we're sitting on the sofa and, um, and he says, I've, ha- I've got to take you to my sisters. One of his sisters had just passed on two weeks before that. Um, and he said, I got to take you to his sisters. Well, all I'd heard from my mom is how, how mean his sisters were to her. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, here I am, you know, I, I've gotten through this part of actually meeting him and saying hello and finding out that, you know, he does love me, but now I've got to be taken to the the sister uglies, you know? <laughs> so I was like, oh my gosh. And then scarier than that was, he said, well, I'll drive us there. And so here's this man who can hardly walk and he's going to be our chauffeur. But it was okay. We got there and um, met the sisters, and they were just so, so glad to see me. It was it was just beautiful. So, yes, I come back home, and, you know, I've got to tell my mom. I, you know, I didn't even tell my brother I was going. And so I, I call up my brother and tell him what happened. He says, you got to tell mom. I said, I'm not telling mom. He says, you've got to tell mom. I said, nope, I'm not telling mom. I hang up the phone, and I pace back and forth for about a half an hour, and I was like, he's right I got to go tell my mom. So yes, I I did go tell her. She was definitely not too happy with me. But you know, it's family. And over the weeks and the months, she softened, she got better. And I was actually able to have her reconcile with these sisters that she didn't like. You know, my dad passed on and three months later, and um, I would travel to Chicago for business. And sometimes my mom would come with and visit her sister. And I asked her to come with. And I actually got her to go see my Aunt Mary. And um, they knocked on the door and it was, you know, bygones be bygones, you know, beautiful Italian family that that forgives and forgets. And I really feel they taught my mom how to do that because my mom hung on to her anger for a long time. But um, once she met them, they became friends again. And it was, you know, it was beautiful. So again, what was your profession at the time that all this happened? Forty years. Um, my, I was, I had, I had a cottage industry making toys. Oh, you were still in the toy business then. I was in the toy business. Yeah. Your your van was not sending you strong enough messages yet to change. Not at that point, but you know, at, you know, we reach parts in our life that just completely change how how we deal with life. And I think after meeting my dad and understanding that the love that I didn't have was really there. I think it gave me the strength to stand up and say, I can, I can do something more. I can do something better. And, you know, the work that I'm doing now, which I've been doing for over three decades is really, you know, heart centered. It's, it's helping people. It's, it's showing people how they don't have to suffer emotionally or physically. And I really think meeting my dad catapulted me in, into that position. I mean, I already, I always had that. I mean, I was a child of the, you know, in this, in the sixties, a teenager in the sixties, you know, yeah. flower child. So I, I looked into meditations and yoga way back when no one was doing yoga. No, you know, I mean, well, people, but you know, not, not in the masses that they're doing it now. And, and uh, my toy company, even when I sold those toys, I saw my tents as a safe haven for children to go into. I would fill those with light. Um, so that if there was any disturbance going on in the home, that the children could could go into that little tent and it would be a place where they would feel loved and peace. And so I always worked with energy through, I'd say, from my 20s on 
So stepping into the vocation that I have now as, as an intuitive, um, it was easy. You know, it, w- it was familiar to me. And I, th- I think meeting my dad helped help do that. Well, when you decided to change from toys, what really made you go into uh, learning Reiki and, and being a Reiki master and, and going into the whole profession that you have now? Because that's quite a major change in direction. That, that is a jump, isn't it? Um, five years before I, I started learning Reiki, I, um, I looked, someone gave me a book, said, oh, you should, you, should, you should look into this. You should do Reiki. And I thumbed through it and I said, I'm not a healer and threw it off to the side. But within five years and after meeting my dad and just knowing that my business had to be different and it had to be, I wanted it to be something that helped people more than I was doing now rather than just games and toys and playing. And so someone presented Reiki to me again. And this time it clicked in my head. I was like, okay, I'll look into this. But what happened was that um, the friend of mine that told me about Reiki says, you need to go to my Reiki master. I said, okay. And she lives in Germany, outside of Frankfurt, Germany. And um, I'll I'll tell you, you know, Boulder, Colorado is a very metaphysical community. Mm -hmm. And um, you can throw a rock in any direction and probably hit a Reiki master, you know, dime a dozen. But somehow I was guided to leave the country, which I've never done before, and go to this woman and, and learn Reiki. So I went there. Um, She was very German. She was very strict. She was very traditional, which is not how I teach Reiki now. But, um, and, you know, why did I go there? Well, I found um, that I had a past life in Germany, in this town, at this church. I mean, I would say, maybe a year or so before that, in meditation, I saw past lives. Um, and and so I understood on a, on a feeling level, at least I saw in my own mind's eye, lives that I had had before. And when I was in Germany, and as I've traveled more throughout the world, I find that when I'm at a place where I've been before, I get emotional. Mm-hmm. Um, in Egypt, I stood by Coptic jars, I had seen myself uh, as uh, someone in Egypt that took the organs out of noblemen's and put them in Coptic jars. And when I stood at these particular Coptic jars, and I saw many there, I started to sob. And I walked away. I came back three times. And every time I stood by those jars, I cried, knowing in my mind that those were the jars that I worked with. So in Germany, I'm standing in front of this big church. We, we go into her small village and we're walking around and I stand be, in front of these big wooden doors and I start to cry. And I was like, I was a priest in that church. And then I was guided to just turn around and I turned behind me and I saw ruins of a castle. And again, in my mind's eye, when I did meditation, I saw myself tortured as a priest because I didn't follow the way they wanted me to do it, (laughs) which is how I am now. And I said, that's where I was tortured. And even walking through the countryside, I saw a small church. And again, tears came to me and I knew I had lived there. That was where I was, my my parish as a small boy. So why did I go to Germany? All these these things that sometimes you just do because you just feel you should. Do you ever get that, Michael? Oh, yes. And you don't understand why? You know, why did I quit my toy business in the moment? Because I knew there was something out there. I knew it. Well, and that's all the understanding you need to make a choice. If you're certain, then that's what you do. My favorite example of that kind of thing is a real simple one. Do you ever play Trivial Pursuit? Uh, Not very well. (laughs) But how many times do you play the game or do you interact with other people who are playing the game? Somebody asks the question, You know the answer and you just say, well, that can't be right. And you give a different answer and it's the wrong answer. And the one that you thought at first was the right answer truly was correct. And that happens (laughs) all the time in Trivial Pursuit. And (laughs) so when I play Trivial Pursuit, I have learned to listen because usually it's the right answer. And we, we ignore our inner guide so much. We ignore... Mm -hmm those things that are really telling us what to do. So as they say in Australia, New Zealand, good on you for what you're doing and and how you do it. 
Um, so what did what did uh, you make? Let, let me let me let me just uh, segue on top of that. I'm going to give a little um, exercise that that I have in some of my books on how to build that intuition. I mean, just what you're saying, you second guess it. So I say this is what you do for the next. If you want to if you want to create a new pattern, you do it for 30 days or mm-hmm. at least 21 days, you know. And so every time you have an intuitive thought, you should write it down. Mm-hmm. Just just by having a little notebook, of course, now we've got our phone. So in your phone, you could have in your notes, an intuitive thought. I wasn't going to go down the highway this particular way. I'm going to go the other way. And you find out that the way you were first going to go now has a, a block up of traffic. Yeah. That's an intuitive thought. You go to the grocery store. You think you need something. You get it and you find out, yes, indeed, I do. Just keeping track of all those intuitive thoughts, because we have way more than we think we do, you will start building that confidence within yourself to trust, as you found, to go with that first thought. So that's one practice. Okay, back to your question. A lot of people have, have asked me if I ever felt any nudge or reason not to go to the World Trade Center on September 11th, even though there was a very severe thunderstorm that came right over our house at 1230 that morning, I never had, and I can sit here today and say, I never had a single inkling that I shouldn't go. Wow. And and there was no message that said, don't go. And what happened though, at, at, the World Trade Center for me, um, I think, justified that, just all the experiences that I had that day. But the reality is that um, we we do get so many different kinds of things that if we would but listen, we would be so much better off. But we tend not to. We ignore them or we say that can't possibly be right. And then, yeah. as you say, it turns out it is. And I think your exercise is a very good one that people who don't listen to those inner thoughts really are um, are missing out on something extremely valuable. Well, right. so, so what and, did you, and, go ahead. Yeah, well, and you know, you go into the trade center, we could call that divine order because it completely changed how you work and what you do and, and how much more you can give sure. to people than you were doing there. And I don't feel divine order is necessarily God given. I mean, it can be if that's your belief system, but I feel our divine order comes from within ourselves. We know within ourselves, we've got something more to do that can help people, society, life grow. And, and we follow that. Well, of course, the, the reality is that is God. And um, yeah. I think it's all interrelated. Yeah. What did your Reiki master think of your past life experiences? I assume you divulged those to her when you were in Germany. Um. You know, I can't, you know, I don't remember a lot, lot with her. Um, we talked a lot. I shared it. She was, she was very stoic, let's mm. say that way, you mm. know, so there wasn't, you know, a lot coming from her. And I'll tell you this, when I first learned the energy, I didn't feel it. I mean, when I teach people Reiki, they feel the energy coming through their hands and all through their body. But with this woman, I didn't feel anything happening there. Mm. It wasn't because she wasn't a good teacher. It was just, it was just different. I, but I, it was about trust. So we're going back to why did I follow through? I, I get attuned to the energy, which channels the energy into you and you feel it. I didn't feel any of that. I didn't feel energy coming out of my hands, but in my heart of hearts, I knew this was my path. And as I continued to practice it and get move on to the higher levels, I started feeling a lot more energy. But it really helped me to teach people to tell them, I didn't feel anything, but it works. And it's channeling love into the body. Reiki is channeling the infinite love of the universe into your head, into your heart. You channel it out your hands to a situation, to a person, or to yourself. And it's just working with love. It's 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 pretty simple. Well, tell us a little bit more about what Reiki is. <clears throat> um, Reiki, like I say, is channeling the infinite love of the universe through your body into another. Well, when we heal at the deepest level, we heal through love. On some level, we're allowing the medicine to work, allowing the procedure the doctor's giving you to work, or just trusting that your body can be better. And 
So building that love in and around a person allows them to get better and understand things in a different perception. And we sort of talked about compassion, but, you know, compassion, and we talked about looking at what goes on with other people. It's it's perception. How do you perceive something that makes you um, ill? You know, a lot of um, illnesses that come in are from stress. Doctors will tell us, you know, this is happening, you know, because you're stressed, you know, your heart is hurting or whatever. So if we could be less stressed, that means that we would have to have a different perception of what's happening around us. And coming into a space of love or feeling love around you or asking love to come in you is going to put you to a, a, a softer space so you can see things in a different way. So Reiki channels in loves and gives you a new perspective. And once you have the new perspective, you can act differently. You can feel differently. Your body's going to relax because Reiki just doesn't come into your physical body. We have four bodies. We have a physical body. We have an emotional body, which is an etheric body. It's about, you know, an inch or two off our, our, our skin. Hence why we like to hug, why we shake hands. It's that touching of that emotional body that we're really looking for. The mental body is a little bit further out, probably about 18 inches out, where all those thoughts that run through our head are right there in our face. And then the spiritual body is right at the edge. So Reiki not only comes into the physical body, but goes through the emotional body, calms that emotion, goes into the mental body, gives you a new perception of the thoughts that you've been having, and it's charged with that spiritual body, which is that God-given right that we come into our life with. Is Reiki always hands-on, so it's a, a physical touch, or is some, it something you can do remotely? Yeah, some masters teach it hands-on. Yes, you can do it remotely. When you move up on the levels, it definitely can be sent remotely, and I work with people all around the world, and um even though I do counseling, at some point I might say, you know, just close your eyes, relax. I'm going to direct this healing energy, this loving Reiki energy into you. And they, and I always check in, you know, what do you notice? What do you sense? What's different? What's the same? And, and they feel it even across the miles. And that's, that's the beauty of it. That's certainly pretty cool. And it's great to have that that kind of experience. How about your your family, your children, husband? Um, do they do Reiki or? Um, I have trained, let's see, two of my three children, you know, not all of them <laughs> go along. But um, two of my three children have learned it and 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 use it not as practitioners, but just in their everyday yeah. life. Right. Um, my little granddaughter, I uh, one time I picked her up from from uh, preschool and she says, wait a minute, Nona, I, I can't go right now. I have to go help Billy. Um, he fell down and I have to go give him Reiki. And she went over to him and you know, <laughs> put her hands on him. And then, you know, just done a few seconds and then and then came back again. So it's it's sort of cool. <laughs> well, it really is. And um, it's it, always good to explore. It is. And, and it's fun. And what I find with Reiki is that when, when I train someone in Reiki and they can go home and place their hands on someone and someone actually feels calmer, um, their headache subsides, their backache goes away. It makes them realize, oh my gosh, if I've got this within me and I can do this, I can do anything. And I've seen it over and over, over the decades that I've taught that people step out of their vocation that they had and move to something that serves them better. Um, they, they move to new locations, they change family, they change, not family, but, you know, friends. Um, it, it really empowers them. It really is a, an empowerment kind of thing. It's not like you've got to learn it and, you know, be a practitioner and give treatments to people, but it just shows you that you have the power to change your life and understand and perceive what's best for you and follow it. Right. So there's a lot of aspects to it that people don't think about when they think of Reiki hands-on healing. But again, it requires you to be open and to absorb information and process it. And I noticed when I was reading some of the information about you, you talk about getting information into the left side of the brain mm -hmm. um, and then allowing the right side to accept it spiritually. Yeah. 
Uh, well, and, and spiritually, because the right side is the feeling sensing part. And that's the part that we don't trust. Yeah. And once we start trusting it, we can get a deeper, a deeper connection um, to what we see as, as spirit or power beyond us or power within us. You know, how, however we focus on that. And, you know, Reiki is not the only thing I do. I mean, I also, you know, from that, it stems out into meditation, which, again, helps people understand that they have the power to do what they need to do for themselves to calm their, themselves down. You know, they don't need to, you know, take take drugs to to be more relaxed. You know, medit- and meditation, people get so scared about meditation. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got to have absolutely no thoughts. It's like, no, that, that's that's not what it's about. It's about just changing that thought from that auto rewind that you have. And so meditation is putting in a different thought, seeing a different picture. And and um, you, know, you don't have to do it for hours on end. No. You know, 20 minutes is good. And when I start people out, I say, do it for five minutes. Just close mm-hmm. your eyes, and, you know. Just think about ocean waves. Uh, I often start with the breath, watching how your lungs rise and just drop down. And when we breathe, the rising of our lungs takes some effort. But when we exhale, they just drop all by themselves. And it's going into that space of letting go, breathing in and letting go. That's really it. It's not about having no thoughts. It's not having directed thoughts it's letting go and letting your mind really go where it chooses to go and you just doing that and following along and not trying to control right and and it it gets to be fun i mean there's a feeling there's a sensation in your body that is so uplifting when when you meditate that it's like yeah i want to i want to hit that again yeah yeah and Again, if you learn how to do that and to let go and to let your mind direct you, if you will, um, again, that will enhance your your being in your life a whole lot. And it will help you in understanding so many things about other people um, and and what's happening to you as well. Yeah, well, you know, we, we give our body a rest. We, we lay down at night and we sleep. But we never really give our mind that that reprieve. And meditation, just 20 minutes a day, gives your mind that rest. And we start figuring things out better and start working with both sides of the brain. I mean, we know that the left side is our that analytical side. The right side is the feeling side. But if we could be in that whole brain thinking, we could we could do the analytical and allow the intuitive right brain to tell you which direction to go. Mm-hmm. And, and so just like you were talking about trusting your intuition, you can do that if you meditate because you're going to get that whole brain thinking going on. So you're not battling it. You know, when you've got that one idea that comes in and the other one says, no, that's not it. You know, the intuition comes in and the other one says, no, that can't be it. They stop arguing. Yeah. <laughs> they start, they start communicating better. And I've got, you know, I've got meditations on my website. Um, I, I know you'll put it up for your for your audience. It's lightinternal.com. And there's MP3s on there. And, you know, when you start with meditation, listen to somebody. It's a lot easier to have because as, as a meditator and as a Reiki master, I'm able to bring that calm energy into my voice and into you. So you're going to get into that space a lot faster. Yeah. Um, and and if you don't listen to mine, there's other people out there, but find someone that sounds good to you, feels good to you, makes you relax. And um, it, it's a lot easier to listen to uh, one when you get started. You know, you were talking about sleeping and we don't really let our brains do the things that, that, that they should. The, the fact is that there should never be anything wrong with taking a few minutes at the end of the day just to relax, maybe just think about the day, think about what worked, what didn't work, and let your mind direct you as to how you yeah. deal with it tomorrow. But we don't tend to learn how to be introspective. Right. And, you know, at, at work, and now not that many more people are working at home, but when people worked more in the office, there were, you know, you would get coffee breaks. Yeah. And, and then they stopped the coffee breaks, but people that smoked would go outside and smoke. They would mm-hmm. take their break. So I would I would tell my students, tell you what, 
You know, you don't have to go out and smoke, but just give yourself five minutes. Just put your hands on the computer screen and close your eyes or uh, the, the keyboard and, and just close your eyes for five minutes and give yourself the break that other people are taking. But yours is much healthier. Um, so, And more productive. And more. Yes. And, and I think companies are beginning to learn that, that um, people are more productive when they're happier, when they're relaxed, and there's ways to give them that. Tell us about the, the different products and services that your company does and the name of the company again, and just a little bit about how people can reach out to you and learn more about what you do and so on. Okay. Well, my website's the great place to go. Light internal. A lot of people want to call it light eternal. And it's like, no, it's the light internal. that's within you. Okay. Lightinternal.com. I write a weekly blog and in there, sometimes I'll have meditations that you can listen to. Um, I, I talk about things that um, are pertinent with what, what's going on, how we can um, see things differently, how to deal with, you know, angry people or things that upset us. Lots and lots of information in there. Um, and so you'll find that on the site as um, I've got YouTube videos. So if you put my name in, you know, Marnie, Marnie Vin or Marnie Vin Police, I'll pop up on YouTube. Um, Facebook, not so much. Uh, I got hacked on Facebook a few years ago and was able to get back on. I was like, oh, well, let that go. Um, Instagram, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on Instagram. My products are, I've got five books. Um, Three of the books, the first books I wrote were about personal empowerment using uh, Reiki and other meditative type techniques. One's called um, Finding Your Inner Gift. Second one is Inner Gifts Uncovered. And the third one is Claiming Your Inner Gift. And then uh, you asked about my family. So um, another grandchild who lives in San Francisco, I was telling her a story as we were going through San Francisco, I was in the back seat with her, my daughter's driving and, you know, she's getting sort of fussy. And the story that I told her turned into a book. And um, it's, uh, it's called The House Who Found Its Home. It's a children's book. It's a good reader for uh, early readers because there's repetitive statements. And it's about a house that was living in a place that was too tight and too bright and too noisy. So the house took off to find a new place to live. Mm. And of course, because it's, it's my book, the house learned a valuable lesson. <laughs> there then, you go. Yeah. And the last book is They Did the Best They Could, Discovering Your Path to Compassion with um, beautiful guidance on how you can work through issues that might be bothering you. Um, but as I said, there's MP3 there as well. And, you know, um, anytime that you've got issues, I'd love to work with you through hypnosis, um, guidance, um, counseling just moving energy for you. And, and that's my counseling. So it's, it's all there on the site on lightinternal.com. And, and I, you, and you do that worldwide. So I do. anyone who is listening, who wants to can certainly reach out to you. And I hope that they will. Right. And, and all my books, um, I can, I can ship worldwide as well. So did you publish them yourself? I did. I, mm -hmm. I did do self-publishing. The first three books I did self-publishing because they were my processes and I didn't want to give them away to a publisher because I know mm -hmm. if it doesn't sell the way they want, uh, the book's off the shelf. Yeah. And, you know, once I learned how to do that, I just continued with my other books and, and self-published. And I just love the creative nature of it. Um, the last book, um, you know, I, I created the cover. The background that you see here is is the cover of my latest book. And um, let's see, you can sort of see it here. Um, I worked with fonts and how to do the layout and just that creative part of me, that right brain of me said, create your own books and create how they lay out and do your covers. And it's, it's just fun. And so you have certainly not allowed dyslexia to stand in the way and no. your brain has dealt with that. It has. It's done pretty good. <laughs> Which is cool. Well, mm. I want to thank you for being with us again on Unstoppable Mindset. And clearly, if we're going to talk about someone who's unstoppable, that would be you. <laughs> and I am so glad that you you found us because you actually found us and said, I want to be a guest on your podcast, which I'm right. very grateful for you to have done. And so very much that was great. 
Right. And I've so, I've so enjoyed meeting you and hearing, you know, how you've dealt with diversity and what you've gone through. I mean, I loved your story about riding your bicycle at seven years old by yourself and a neighbor complaining. I, may I, may I take a moment and ask you that? So, um, my father-in-law was blind. And so I, I learned, you know, a lot of things through him. So when you were riding your bike, did you listen for how the air went by you to know if there was something along the side of you? I mean, you knew how far, I mean, how many turns to the end of the corner, you know, how many times did you go around? Tell me how you did it. Well, it's not so much the air going by you. It's just all the echoes and all the sounds. I okay. mean, it's like, uh, how would you describe to someone when you're riding a bike, what it looks like and what you see? How do you describe that sense? Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. You're using different senses to do the same thing. And the, the fact is that with all the different kinds of noises, echoing and, and so on that you can hear, um, it's possible to ride a bike. Now, I'm not going to probably want to be a bike messenger in New York City, <laughs> but I, I enjoyed riding a bike. It's been a long time since I've ridden, but I've enjoyed it. Um, and you learn to trust your senses, which is what we've talked a lot about here. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that with me. And thank you for having me on. I've really enjoyed meeting you. And I and I hope I get to talk to you again. Well, and I think we definitely ought to stay in touch by, by all means. Yes. And when you're listening out there, please go off and give us a five-star rating, especially if you can go to iTunes and do it. We love that. Five-star rating is always helpful. But we want to hear your comments and read your comments. So feel free to leave those as well. Email me at michaelhi at accessibility.com or go to www.michaelhingson.com slash podcast. And uh, you can hear all the episodes and leave us comments there as well. But definitely, we really appreciate you giving us your feedback and giving Marnie your feedback as well. Reach out to Marnie. I know she would be very happy to talk with you. And uh, if you feel there's some ways that she can help, then let us know how it goes. We yeah. are always interested and we're not going to, we're not going to let Marnie get away. We're going to have more times to chat. Definitely. We have to do more of this as we go forward, but I really enjoyed you today and you having us uh, be a part of your life. And I want to thank you one last time for doing this and for coming on Unstoppable Mindset. Thank you. And thank you for being you, Michael.